I've been married for 20 plus years. I know a little something about listening. Trust me. Hey guys, welcome back to this week's video. Thank you so much for tuning in. As usual, today we're going to talk about the difference between social listening and social intelligence. Now, I want to start off by telling you a quick story. As I said at the very beginning of this video, I've been married 20 plus years, actually going on 22 in August. I know, I know I was like 12 when we got married. But when we first got married, we lived in a very small 1200 square foot kind of condo. And I used to work downstairs on my laptop. And I still do today, but it's, I was very young and immature back then. But every night I would be, you know, everybody would be sleeping. I would, you know, leave a bunch of stuff downstairs. It would be very dirty. I would leave my dirty socks right there on the floor, rolled up in a ball because I probably was shooting baskets somewhere. And the next morning my wife would come up to me and say, honey, can you do me a big favor and just bring your socks and put them in the hamper when you come upstairs for bed? And a lot of times I would be like, yes, honey, I'm listening and I'm, I'm looking at her and I'm nodding my head, but I'm somewhere else in my head. I'm, a, I'm thinking about the football game. I'm thinking about the Lakers game. I'm not really paying attention. And it wasn't until about six months down the road when things started adding up and it became more and more of an issue, right? And uh, when I learned that about my wife and I started to understand kind of what her expectations were, I then started taking my socks and bringing them up into the hamper every night before bed. Now, why is this important? Because this really is the difference between social listening and social intelligence, if you think about it, right? Social listening is nodding your head and saying yes. When you look at intelligence or social intelligence, it does involve listening. You have to listen to your customer, you have to listen to your wife, your friends, your family, but it requires you to kind of peel the onion back a little bit deeper and take action. And that's the core difference between social listening and social intelligence. So I'm gonna start this video by first defining social listening and going through some examples, then defining social intelligence and going through some examples as well. So hopefully it'll paint a clearer picture of the differences by the conclusion of this video. With that said, let's hop in. All right, so let's first start by defining what social listening is. And I think it's really important to really get grounded in what it means and in its definition. And social listening is the process of monitoring social media channels, for mentions of your brand, competitors, products, and more. So it's pretty standard. If you Google it, social listening, there are several different vendors and agencies who've defined this, but it's pretty much the same across the board. It's looking at data, it's understanding what the conversation is, identifying your sources and all that stuff. So let's go through some examples of what a social listening report looks like or some type of trend graphs. And then I wanna jump into social intelligence and define that and then show you some examples there. And you'll see the difference in, in, in looking at uh, how social listening delivers value and how social intelligence delivers a different type of value, okay? So this first graph is really a trend volume graph, right? This could be monitoring mentions of your brand, mentions of your competitors, mentions of your products. You can see spikes and valleys from January through May. Uh, not very insightful, right? But it looks great on a slide. And sometimes you do have to monitor this. You have to track for the performance of a campaign or a program or a brand or your competitors or a topic like 5G or fashion design or uh, consumer goods, whatever it may be. So a trend graph is great because it does show you those spikes and valleys that happen month to month. Okay, so on this slide, it's uh, I call it audience share of conversation, but it really could be called anything. And there's a couple different data points. Well, there's several data points on here, but let's start on the left and then move to the right. So on the left, you see some basic demographics, you know, location, gender, inter you know, or, or generation rather, and then also interest and characteristics. You'll see some people towards the bottom as well. Now, in most social listening platforms, you can build a pretty complex Boolean. You can look at the data and you can do some type of demographic analysis. The, the issue with that is it, it pulls in the demographics and the interests and affinities of everyone in that data set. So it's not as accurate as it would be unless you were to do something a little bit differently. So um, you'll find this again in the brand watch, in uh, Synthesio, NetBase, things like that. On the right is like a share of conversation. So, uh, you know, imagine, you know, doing uh, some bullions around, you know, your competitors and your brand or product or different topics. You can start to get an understanding of, you know, what topic and or brand or competitor are being uh, discussed the most in the form of peer mentions across social media, forums like Reddit, uh, even reviews, re review sites on Amazon and G2, things like that, or even the news media. 
right? So you can you can see what percent of, of that topic or brand or competitor owns the conversation as it relates to other data data points. Okay, so a couple of use cases of social listening, and again, this all seems pretty elementary, and these are things that we've been refining and building over the last 15 years or so, but we know there's a new breed coming into the workforce, and you know they're starting to understand how to use social media from a business standpoint. They already know social media from a personal standpoint, so it's really important to ground you know this new generation who is who are coming into own social listening for organizations or agencies. So uh, again, pretty self-explanatory, but let me just talk through a couple of these. Community management is again sometimes happens in-house, sometimes at agencies. Customer care usually that's in-house or through some um, third-party customer care organization. A crisis monitoring for PR teams to monitor negative mentions or sentiment of a brand or if there's a crisis that kicks off real-time social engagement so I we do this quite a bit where we look at an audiences and see what's trending amongst the audience from a topical standpoint and then create content in real time based on what's trending a, a, against that panel and then influencer engagement kind of the same thing as real-time social engagement although with influencer engagement it's usually a smaller audience of you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, up to about 100 or 150 influencers around a core topic area, and you're doing the same thing. You're, you're listening, you're activating what I call a content engine, and then you are creating content in real time to engage with those influencers. And now when we define social intelligence, it really is the process of mining social and or audience data in order to deliver actionable insights. And these are insights that will drive value, not just for marketing or PR, but if you have innovation teams or R&D or product marketing or product management, um, the insights, if they're used the right way, can really inform a lot of different things in the organization to improve um, that customer experience or product innovation. So this is a model that I've been working on for several years now. I call it the social listening and intelligence maturity model. And it's kind of a sequential model where, where you kind of go through these phases. Now it could be a very accelerated m maturity where you go from reactive monitoring to innovation, social intelligence in six months, or it could be something that takes three to five years. It really depends upon how sophisticated you are, how much budget your company has, and really kind of where you see social listening or customer and audience data as a core piece of your, your marketing and or PR. So let's talk through each of these four pillars and then we will move on. So reactive monitoring is that entry level uh, where you're demonstrating minimal value, siloed results, there's really no platform, you're trying to, you're using, you know, free trials for, you know, every, every two or three months when you're running reports. You're using it for content tracking, maybe some hashtag monitoring, and then possibly some basic community management. Now at some point you're gonna graduate and move on to what I call organized social listening. This is where you have a dedicated social platform. Maybe you've invested in a brand watch or a net base. You do have internal teams using it, although they're using it kind of on demand. And there could be some minimal training. Maybe you put together some PowerPoint slides, done some webinars so that you're training your colleagues, maybe in different geos, or if you work in marketing, maybe it's your PR colleagues so that they can try to use it if they see some value in it. Now, some use cases around that are campaign tracking, you know, certainly issues management is one of those things where, you know, social listening is really nothing. Nobody cares about it until like shit hits the fan. And then it becomes like the number one priority for the CMO. And then consistent monitoring. Maybe you have a schedule where you're monitoring, you know, two or three times a week from 8 to 5 p.m., whatever the whatever the kind of the schedule is, you have there is some consistency in using the platform to monitor the conversation. Then you move to the right and you, do, you become more proactive, right? I call it proactive social listening. You're demonstrating real business value. You're, you have a listening and, and a governance model deployed. Uh, and maybe you have a center of excellence who's responsible for training, for a consistent measurement philosophy, for rolling out new platforms, for negotiating contracts. And some of the use cases around that is really developing a more consistent and integrated customer experience. Part of that is social customer care. And then as I mentioned earlier, that real-time engagement is something that I would refer to as being more proactive in listening to audience conversations and engaging through creative content based on what's trending. And then lastly is that innovative social intelligence where that is kind of ingrained in every piece of the business. 
You're using social and audience data to find markets, market white space, uh, a universal truth about an audience. You're using it to solve customer uh, care problems. You're using it to create content. You're using it to innovate new products based on what audiences are saying about what they want and what they desire. And that's the use case, right? It's product innovation. It's forecasting. It's building customer advocacy identifying influencers, and then at some point using it to predict, uh, predict an outcome based on uh, what it is you're trying to do from a marketing and or communication standpoint. So this is a model, again, I'm curious where you are on this model, and, and maybe you're kind of in different pieces uh, as it relates to this, you know, again, it's not sequential, it's not like you go from one to the other, you can go from one to 100 overnight, depending upon how sophisticated the, the your company is, how much budget you have, and, and really where you prioritize social listening. I want to talk about the economics of supply and demand because I think this is really important as it relates to social listening and I have some examples here. Now, this is a model that's built off, you know, the the true economic model of supply and demand. But in this case, we are using social data and or analytics to understand and identify the stories, the trends, the content, the things that are keeping your audiences up at night that are demanding their attention. And so depending upon what piece of the company you work in, you could be working in PR, in which case your audience is traditional media. Or if you work in marketing, certainly your, your audience is your customers, in this case, audiences. And one thing I like to ask clients is, okay, now that we understand the, the content and the stories and the trends that are demanding the attention of your audience, are you meeting that demand with your supply of content? And again, regardless of where you sit you know, in the organization, these are all important things to think about, right? Are you getting the right stories based on what, what is top of mind for your audience? Are you publishing content in your blogs and social media based on what your, what, you know, your customers and or the media expects? So when you can achieve that, you then begin to find market white space. And that's really this example here. So imagine you're an AI company and you do an analysis of your customers, and in this case, it's your audience on the right. And you're, when you're analyzing the data, it shows that cloud scaling and integrating AI in the enterprise and also digital transformation are top of mind. That's what your audience is talking about. That's what they're mentioning in their tweets. That's what they're sharing on their, their LinkedIn. That's what they're commenting on on Reddit, etc. Now, if you do the same analysis with content that you produce and publish from an owned media standpoint, blogs, newsroom, web pages, and also the supply of organic and paid content, um, you find that, okay, well, when we publish content, most of the topics that we talk about are security, IoT, and data science. So in this case, there's a huge disconnect, right? There's really no, there's no overlap, right? So you're not meeting the demand of the audience, which means you're not as relevant to them as you should be. Now, here's an example of how that looks, looks um, with real, not, not real data, but a a, an example data set on the left on the left you have an analysis of your owned media and what you publish on social as well as in blogs and it's all broken down by color so if you look on the left you have security machine learning iot and data science those are the four core themes that you are publishing that's the content that you're publishing if you look at it from a volume standpoint and it's all broken down by the size of these pie charts. So security and machine learning account for about, what is that, 60, 65% of the content that you're publishing, followed by IoT and data science. Then you can take it a couple layer, layers further and say, okay, well, what about security do we talk about the most? Well, data security, data protection, cloud, uh, hybrid cloud, what the CISO is saying, info security, et cetera. And, and then when you do the same type of analysis, but on what your audience is saying on the right, well, here's where they're talking about, you know, cloud formation or scaling or digital transformation or remote working. And so when you have these two different data sets and you compare them to one another, you can see that, okay, there's only really one area that's overlapping and that's security. That's great. That means we're doing the right thing. We are pitching the right stories or we're publishing the right content. However, digital transformation, scaling AI, cloud computing, these are things that we don't talk about. So we need to figure out now how we can integrate those topic areas and, and ensure that it's relevant to our audience, but also aligned to our brand. Here's another example of what I would call a persona. And we do a lot of this persona development where you know, you, you've seen templates like this when you Google, Google audience persona or persona in general, you see templates from HubSpot and others. This is real data. This is building an audience and analyzing their affinities and characteristics and channels that they use to understand 
kind of give you a, a really a 360 degree view of their top interests, the their health brand affinities, their fitness affinities, their top influencers. This is a real data. Now, Anna is not obviously a real person. Her age isn't real. That's kind of made up. But the data is all 100% real. And the same for this one, right? It's a very similar persona, but we have some fitness uh, brand affinity, some top interests, preferred channels. But now we have a conversation analysis. So what about fitness is top of mind for this audience? Right, so community, mental health, fitness, family, friends, etc. This is how they talk about going to work out, or going to Soul Cycle, or going to um, some type of you know gym to work out with friends and family. They're doing it for a lot of different reasons outside of just abs. Right, they want to build community. They they're doing it to achieve you know more mental health stability. They're doing it to be with community and friends and family. So this is kind of combining not just brand and interest affinities, but also the conversations that they're having the most about uh, the areas that you think are important if you are a fitness brand. And here we have another type of persona where we don't, um, we kind of built a broader persona around commercial real estate agents. And from the audience segmentation of, you know, bio searches of, you know, different interests and affinities, we can categorize them in different types of uh, clusters. So we have C-suite, reporters and analysts, managers, investors, VCs, and brokers. And so the great thing about audience analytics is you can dig down and dig much deeper into each one of these to understand basically the conversational drivers, the media affinities, the channel usage, the types of content that they're sharing. And this is another example of a IT decision maker. So the head of IT, um, in this case, we have her top media affinities, her top channel preferences. We also have her software purchase factors. So how does she purchase software? What are those core things that are top of mind for her when she is you know, determining what to purchase, whether it's security software or data storage, utility, security are the top two, followed by design, then mobility and performance. So, um, and then the conversation on the right, right? Data science, insights, and uh, cloud and CIO, these are the things that are top of mind for the head of IT. And again, these are real people um, and uh, audiences that can be built and analyzed. Um, and this really is social intelligence. And this is the last slide I wanted to share. This is kind of taking it a little bit further than what we just showed you, looking at CIOs. And when you look at their conversation at the purchase funnel, so when they're in the awareness phase, what are they talking about? When they're in the consideration phase, what's top of mind? All the way to loyalty. And, and, and understanding what drives uh, retention for them as a customer to different software and or hardware uh, uh, so te technology vendors. And so this is what I would call like mapping uh, an audience to the buyer's journey. And this is extremely useful, not just for marketing or PR, but also for sales. If sales understands what's top of mind for their customers at each of these phases, they can really learn and get smarter about how they approach uh, a meeting with a CIO or a head of IT, or how they send follow-up materials, or how they even reach out uh, for the first time on LinkedIn or using Sales Navigator, things like that. And I really do hope that this uh, made sense to you and I hope that it was helpful for you. And that, my friends, concludes our time together today. I hope that my explanation and examples really does paint a clear picture as to what the differences are between social listening and social intelligence. A lot of times they're used synonymously. You know, you might say that you're looking for a job related to social intelligence or social listening or monitoring or whatever it is. But there is a key differentiator between the idea of taking data, social data or other type of data, and using it to inform something or solve a business problem or something along those lines. So before I let you go, I got to do what good YouTubers do and say, don't forget to like or subscribe or share because you can't comment on my videos and there's a reason why uh, this video, if it makes sense to you, if you feel that, you know, a colleague or a friend or someone in the industry might find value, uh, please share it and let me know either through Twitter or other means, uh, LinkedIn or email if you have that. So thanks again. I hope you're well. I hope you're safe as you're preparing back, uh, preparing to get back to work if you are. And until I see you next time, have a safe rest of your week and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.